Krista White, and welcome to Industrial Sage Studios. We are so excited to share with you one of Modex 2020's top 10 educational seminars live from our studio. So get ready to increase your productivity with these ergonomic principles. I'm joined virtually today by Jeff Hoyle, Director of Ergonomic Services at the Ergonomic Center of North Carolina State University. And we also have Rob Doucette, the Senior Applications Engineer with Boston Tech. So we're going to get right in and get started with Jeff, who is going to quickly define ergonomics and tell us why they are so important. Thanks for joining us today, Jeff. Well, certainly thank you for having us and welcome everybody for um, this, to this webinar. And I guess just jumping right into this definition and I may be uh, preaching to the choir here. Um, but really, uh, I will say ergonomics is a scientific discipline, but really just a quick and simple definition it's just fitting the task to the worker, not the worker to the task. So it's really thinking about the needs, the capabilities, and the limitations of us as people and trying to figure out how can we change the job or the work to meet our needs and our capabilities. There's another definition of, of ergonomics that I like to also use that's not up here. Uh, it's one that the International Ergonomics Association uses that basically says ergonomics has two primary aims, right? Number one is to improve employee well-being, and number two is to optimize performance, okay? So if ergonomics is really done right, uh, both of those aims uh, can be met. And, and so why is ergonomics more important now than, than ever before? I think we all know that uh, there's no such thing as the average worker. Uh, especially here in the United States where we have a very diverse workforce. We have people from various countries, uh, various ethnicities, all moving here and working together. And, you know, the goal behind ergonomics is to try to accommodate the majority of our workforce. So it's trying to accommodate different strength capabilities, different uh, sizes of individuals, um, different reach capabilities. Uh, and obviously there's uh, other societal trends that are going on today that uh, make ergonomics more important now than ever before. Uh, the aging trend, this is a not only within the United States, but internationally. Uh, and what happens as, as we age? Uh, yes, we get wiser, right? But other things start to happen as well. Our strength goes down, uh, tissue tolerance goes down, vision loss, uh, hearing loss, and we have to accommodate for this aging workforce because uh, people are working longer and longer, uh, especially with the economic crisis that we're in. So I, I imagine that uh, that trend is going to continue. So bottom line, one size does not fit all. And next. Uh, so again, one of the goals behind ergonomics is to try to mitigate or reduce the risk of these work-related musculoskeletal disorders. So what are we talking about here with these work-related musculoskeletal disorders? It's basically damaging or weakening of that musculoskeletal system. So those soft tissues and bones in your body, your muscles, your tendons, your ligaments, your cartilage. Uh, if you've experienced, you know, back pain in your lifetime and what do they say? 85% of the population experiences back pain during their lifetime. Uh, so that's what we're talking about. Um, tendonitis, um, you know, de Quervain syndrome, uh, neck pain, um, epicondylitis in your elbow. Those are all examples of work-related musculoskeletal disorders that occur. So, Jeff, we know that how it feels. You said 80% of people are, are dealing with these kinds of disorders. But looking big picture, how big of a problem are these disorders in the workplace? Sure, I'd be happy to touch on that. And, and luckily, there's some, uh, there's some good agencies out there that summarize some of this data for us. So if we advance uh, to this next uh, slide, um, one of those government agencies is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So they look at these injuries year after year, and they're looking at those severe injuries, your lost work time injuries, your restricted duty injuries, and they categorize those uh, based on cause. So you can see from this graphic here, uh, and this is a recurring theme that happens every year, the leading cause of these severe types of injuries are musculoskeletal disorders, representing 33% of the total, which again is, is the leading category by far. Next. And so how much um, economic impact do these work-related musculoskeletal disorders have uh, in our industry? 
So this is a graphic that uh, li the Liberty Mutual Insurance Company puts together uh, every year where they look at the um, top 10 most disabling uh, U.S. workplace injuries, and they categorize those uh, based on cause and then the direct costs associated with those. So these are your top 10 categories. So if you look at the left-hand uh, side, I guess, of this graphic, the one that you see there um, in green, the leading category of injuries is overexertion. So what are these overexertion injuries? These are injuries caused by lifting, uh, carrying, pushing, pulling, um, your material, manual material handling types of uh, tasks, right? And that represents 23.4% of these top 10 most, um, you know, the top 10 causes, and that's $13.7 billion. So a pretty good, uh, pretty good chunk of change there. Uh, and then if we look at some of the others um, causes that are considered ergonomics related, you can see they're about midway through, it's called other exertions or bodily reactions. So I know that one's not overly intuitive just by reading the, uh, the category, what they, what they call, what they um, claim it. But it, if you look at how Liberty Mutual defines that, these are injuries from uh, reaching, uh, twisting, uh, climbing, uh, bending, working in awkward posture. So those are ergonomic related. Uh, so this does not include slips, trips, and falls. And that's another 7.2% of these disabling injuries and another $4.2 billion annually just here in the U.S. Uh, and then if you look at that last category uh, to the far right that you guys can see there is repetitive motion. And obviously that one is ergonomics related. So that's another 2.6%. Uh, and another $1.5 billion. Um, so if you total those three categories together, that's roughly $20 billion that employers just here in the US are spending annually on these types of ergonomic related injuries. So obviously a, a big problem. Okay, next. And, and again, those were just the direct costs, right? That the, the what that's what Liberty Mutual tracks. So the, your direct costs are the the workers' compensation costs, the medical costs, the uh, the cost to to take something to court or or to pay for attorneys um, if it is a litigation case. Um, those are the things that are a little easier to measure, kind of tip of the iceberg, uh, easier to track. Uh, however, there are also indirect costs. Um, things harder to measure, below the surface, but still really impact your bottom line. So what are we talking about there? We're talking about uh, the time it takes and the costs associated with training somebody else up to take somebody's spot if, if somebody's been injured. Um, you know, the, the, the cost it takes to investigate one of these accidents, uh, the loss of productivity uh, that results in, in you know, when, when these injuries occur, low employee morale, which we know uh, impacts productivity. Uh, and a lot of times, if you see these very physically demanding types of tasks, you'll see high turnover rates. And we all know that that's, that's a cost uh, associated with, with the business. And, um, and OSHA actually has some numbers around these and has done some, uh, has, has done some analysis. And these indirect costs can be up to five times as much as those direct costs that are paying out. And again, long story short, these, all of these things impact your bottom line and can even impact your, you know, your bonuses or your stock options if that's something that your employer provides. Next. So I guess speaking of, uh, speaking of stock options, uh, this was from a, a study uh, done by the um, uh, occupational uh, environmental um, uh, health journal that basically looked at the S&P 500 over a 13 to 14 year period of time and looked at market performance. And they compared that S&P 500 to um, basically it was a group of over 50 companies that had very strong safety and health cultures. And part of that uh, strong safety and health culture was having a strong ergonomics program. And you can see that over, the, again, this 13 to 14 year period, they outperformed the S&P 500 by over three times. So if you're one of those that, that says, well, I don't have any data that says safety pays or 
ergonomic uh, pays dividends, here you can see exactly <laughs> that it does um, from this from the study that was conducted. Okay, next. Uh, this was something I, we also wanted to share with you guys. It's a free online calculator that OSHA provides through their website. Uh, there's you'll see that link there in the QR code, uh, but it's a pretty handy tool to use if you're trying to develop a business case. Um, you know, to make some purchases for ergonomic equipment or to implement an ergonomics program, uh, you can find a lot of good data uh, based on this database uh, of how much injuries cost based on various types. So it allows you to select the type of injury and then it gives you estimates for both direct as well as indirect costs. Uh, so you can get those numbers there. And then if you know what your company's profit margin is, you can put that profit margin in uh, to this calculator and it will tell you how much additional sales you have to make to pay for that one injury to offset it. So it can be a very handy tool that you guys can use uh, to help you cost justify some ergonomic improvements out there in, in your workplace. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. That's awesome, Jeff. And, and now that you've explained the realities of the impacts, we want to know what we can do. So is there any real evidence that instituting ergonomics has been effective? Absolutely, there has been. And uh, it's quite nice because the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries has really summarized a group of case studies. They analyzed over 250 different cases in which companies implemented ergonomic improvements in their workplace and they summarized all that data for us and they saw that ergonomics uh, not only reduces cost but it has a, a multitude of other benefits such as improving productivity um, improving accuracy and, and product quality when it's done correctly uh, improves employee engagement which we all know is a critical piece to having a strong uh, culture or safety culture uh, and overall creates, like I said, creates this better overall safety and health culture uh, within these companies that have implemented these improvements. So you may be asking yourself, well, that might be nice to say, but by how much, <laughs> how much of an impact, um, you know, has, has implementing ergonomic improvements really made for these? So uh, we've created this table that, that summarizes this evidence. So how you read this table, just quickly kind of skimming through it, uh, so there were 90 different cases uh, that were summarized here that reported a difference in work-related musculoskeletal disorders. So they implemented an ergonomic improvement and saw roughly an average of 59% reduction in these work-related musculoskeletal disorders. If you look over to the far right of this table, you can see what that range is. So 8% to 100% um, for that particular category. Um, I think what what makes more sense for us just to summarize this is just to look at those means, those averages. So just summarizing this real quickly, you know, 78 different case studies reported on lost work days and saw a 75% reduction. Um, 52 uh, reported workers' comp costs and, and showed an average of 68% reduction. Uh, 61 looked at productivity and saw a 25% improvement. Um, and then there were 36 that, that reported on a payback period and, and saw on average uh, 0.7 years. So what is that? About eight and a half months, I think. And that's important. Most employers will, you know, they'll give you the green light if you can show a payback period in, in less than a year. Uh, next. And, and then just a few other uh, statistics to throw at you. Uh, eight, diff eight different case studies reported on a on a difference in quality, right? Where they track the number of scrap parts or errors or defects in the products that they manufacture and saw a 67% reduction, uh, which is really in turn, uh, I guess a 67% uh, improvement in product quality. Uh, 34 different cases looked at turnover and saw a 48% reduction in turnover. Absenteeism, 11 cases showed a 58% reduction. And then there were six different uh, case studies that, that actually on a cost benefit ratio. So not a, not a ton of cases out there for that one, but how you read that is for every dollar spent in an ergonomic improvement, it paid itself back 45 and a half times over. So that's a pretty good payback.
Uh, and then this, uh, what the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries did based on this set of 250 different case studies is they gave us a free uh, return on investment calculator that you guys can all access and use uh, to help you sell it uh, within your organization. So this allows you to input your own um, injury data over the last three years, and it automatically populates um, some cost numbers, both direct and indirect costs associated with, with whatever injury type you select. Uh, and then there's also some selection. So it's all drop down, point and click. Uh, you have to select, you know, the, the productivity improvement uh, as well as how much it, it impacted, you know, employee morale. There's a couple of other assumptions that you have to make, but it, it does a really nice job of giving you a, uh, it automatically calculating a return on investment, a payback period, an annual savings over not just that first year, but it automatically calculates it over three years and five years, shows you a nice little graphic. Uh, so it's a really great, uh, great tool that you guys can use to help you, again, try to sell ergonomics and cost justify it within your own organization. So I'd encourage you to you know, go in there, play around with it, you can modify things and tweak it, you know, based on um, cost model numbers within your organization. So it's pretty handy uh, place to start. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Lots of good numbers coming from that case study. Right now, let's bring in Rob Doucette and, and talk about some examples of how you can implement some basic ergonomic principles into your operations and in your workstations. Hi, Rob. How are we doing? Good. Excellent. Well, I wanted to go over some of the basic ergonomic principles that we apply when we're putting together these applications. Uh, and the five we're looking at today uh, starts off with optimizing position. Um, then we're going to start looking at eliminating extreme movements, uh, minimizing forces and repetition, uh, order and color coding, and finally, uh, optimize lighting. So as we move on, um, I mean, I have had the privilege of working on many different uh, projects over the years with large companies. And funny enough, one of the first questions people ask me is, oh, how did this person do it? Um, but again, talking about challenges is the answer to that question is, is really, they may have done it this way, but your operation is different and everything, no two operations that I've ever seen do things quite the same. But in addition to challenges like that, um, we have funny enough people. Um, as Jeff mentioned earlier, uh, differences in, say, gender, uh, height, uh, ethnicity, uh, people's physical abilities, and age can be all over the map. So when you're designing these uh, applications or, I mean, these, these uh, cells, you have to keep this all in mind because, again, it's fitting the task to the worker, not the, the worker to the task. Um, so as we move forward... Let's take a look at the first uh, principle. Let's look at optimizing position. In this example, I'm going to see uh, a multi-shift, multi-operator uh, facility. And let's take a look at this individual in the front, in the middle. Uh, this person he has a station that has been set up for them. It, they are in a very neutral position, so they can reach everything. They don't have to extend very far. But as we move on to different shifts or different people come in and work on these stations, uh, we start to see these problems. As you can see, looking towards the right, you have an operator that is shorter than the original operator. So as you can see, this person now has to kind of adjust themselves to, to work on this station. You see that they are starting to reach above their shoulder and they're stretching. Um, and now, again, as you can see, the height of the surface is not ideal, so they're not working at the optimum position. And then they are extending their feet and stretching, and they're trying to push themselves up in order to work on the station. Overall, not good. But so we go through and we fix this, but now we've caused problems for the first person. So we've lowered the station, but now we run into the opposite problem. They have to bend over in order to work on the station. It's not optimal anymore. It's not neutral. So now they're starting to strain their neck because they're starting to look down. Their back is starting to be bent. So now, again, this may not be a problem in the beginning, but over time, this is most certainly going to affect this operator. 
So what can we do? If we move on to the next slide, here's an optimal solution, a height adjustable workstation. As you can see, you can have the height set for the first individual. So now they are back in a neutral position. And then as different operators come in, for as we saw the shorter individual, they can lower the station and it puts it all back into a neutral position. It puts people into what we call the first or second zones. So now let's look at another example. This is also optimizing position, but in this particular scenario, we're gonna look at uh, work instructions or documentation. Now, this might be something for say like an assembly task, could be instructions, how the individual is supposed to put these pieces together. Or in a fulfillment operation, this could be invoices or just labeling. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side, this individual has a stack of papers, we'll say, or a notebook. They have to look at these uh, materials, and in order to do so, it's laid down on this surface, and they have to bend their neck. So again, something that in the beginning may not be too much of a problem, but as time goes on and the more they do it, it's going to start uh, more issues. They're going to start hurting. So what can we do to fix something like this? Uh, if we look to the right, you have an individual we've implemented a monitor on. Uh, it is becoming more and more common for companies to digitize information. Again, work instructions. You can access most of these things on computers as well as invoices for orders and such. Uh, so what we do is we put that information right in front of the operator, in this case on a monitor arm, and it puts it right in their field of vision. So they don't have to look down in order to access the information. Puts them in a much more neutral position for their body and neck. So let's move on to the next example, or I'm sorry, let's look at a couple of ways we can help optimize position. These are some of the accessories as we've shown in the last example that can help with these ergonomically sound positionings. We have height adjustable arms. These are, I would say, probably the best solutions. Uh, as you can see, these arms, as we're going from left to right, this is a pneumatic arm and pneumatic keyboard tray. These allow you to not only have the monitors and keyboards in a good position for one individual, but as someone else comes to the station, they allow you to adjust the heights on the fly. So again, the best range of adjustability and flexibility. As we move towards the right, we have articulating, oh, I'm sorry, jump back. As we look at articulating arms, again, much better positioning than what we saw in the first example as a bad example. Uh, it does allow you to move the monitors in or out, and it does put the keyboard at a much better position, but it does not allow you to adjust the height. So again, definitely an improvement upon just having something on a surface, but you know, not as good as the height adjustable arms. Uh, there are also types of combined arms, but again, they're mostly articulating, not much height adjustability. There are also keyboard trays, excellent uh, items for putting keyboards out of uh, reach for when you're not using them. So again, one of the things that we do when we're designing a workstation is we try to take anything that doesn't pertain to the task off the work surface, because again, in, in you need that space to do what you're trying to do. You don't need a bunch of things cluttering it up. So these are ideal for keyboard trays and moving them out of the, the site. Next slide, please. So let's look at the situation of eliminating extreme movements. In this example, uh, we're gonna be building boxes and packaging uh, these boxes on the work surface. So. As you can see in this first picture, uh, you have built some large boxes. Now, you can also see that there's a small box on there. Now for small boxes, a, a station like this, it works fine. But once you start building larger boxes, as you can see, in order to fill the box or even just to see what's in the box, the individual has to look up and over into the box. And as they're reaching, it can cause you to put your arm over your shoulder, which will cause shoulder issues in the future. So one of the solutions that we commonly see is you can have a box building 
uh, shelf or even a table for that matter. Um, what this does is you still have that main surface, which works very well for the smaller boxes. But as you get into the larger boxes, it puts the box at a lower position. So it's easier for the operator to see into the box and load the box. And as you can see, it puts them in, again, a much better neutral position because it keeps their arms under their shoulder height. And it also, again, improves their visibility into the box. Next slide, please. Another example of extreme movements. Let's take this example of having packing material uh, below the surface. Uh, in this example, we have a roll of bubble wrap under the main surface. Uh, as the operator is required to use this material, they now have to go under the surface in order to go get it, in which requires them to uh, bend over it bends their hips and waist. And as you can see, they also have to reach. So their shoulders, knees, back, lower back, it's all getting strained. So one way that we can take care of this type of scenario is we can put holders above the surface, spool holders or rods. Uh, in this case, we have moved that roll above the surface onto a, a refillable rod. And now it's right in front of the operator and in addition to the box building shelf, it puts this all in neutral position and it allows their body to remain upright throughout the entire process. Next slide, please. Here's a couple examples uh, with some of the items that we had just talked about. Uh, as you can see, we have the spool holders for the bubble wrap. Uh, we have box building shelves below the work surface. You can even add things like corrugate storage carts for larger corrugate storage that can't fit on the station itself. On the maroon station, we have examples of things like printer pullout shelves. Again, very valuable because as we've all seen, printers can take up a lot of space, especially if you see that one there, that's a pretty big one. Uh, printer pullout shelves allow you to get them off the surface, clears up the area, makes it much easier to work in. And we've also shown examples of this label trough. Again, a multi-use item that can be used for labels. Um, intuitive item, again, most folks use rods. Uh, great, they work great, just as good as the trough until you need to replace one of those rolls. And then you're stuck taking the whole rod out to uh, replace that middle roll. But so just a few examples. So let's look at the example of minimize repetitive, repetitive movements. Um, here's a challenge. Frequently used items for repetitive tasks placed at the rear of the workstation, forcing the operator to reach and twist to reach zone three. Well, let's take an example of, say this is an assembly operation and someone is assembling something right in front of them. Normally what we try to do is we try to keep everything related to the task and immediately needed for the task within zone one. Now the zones are depicted here in this picture as the green, zone two is the blue, and zone three. Zone one is where we put the most used items. Zone two is the frequent items, but not as important as zone one items. And zone three is mostly for very rarely or hardly used items. Now, as this person is putting their things together, as you can see, for them to say they're putting together an item that requires bolts and nuts and washers, uh, as they're uh, needing the items, they have to reach all the way across the station. And as you can see, this station is only about 25 to maybe 30 inches deep. And that's, that's quite the extension. And I've seen many stations that go 36 or 48 deep. Uh, not very ergonomically uh, correct, but you still see a lot of it. Um, one of the solutions you can use is something like a arm. Uh, arm and rail systems like these, you can put things like bins on the arms, in which case you can move them into whatever zone you need. That way, when the operator needs them, they're very easily accessible. And when you're done with the, the task, you can push them out of the way. So it also helps you open up that workspace. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna look at minimize forces and repetitive exertions. So in this example, we're gonna look at, again, another assembly task. Uh, in this situation, the individual is putting together, say, a widget that requires them to 
insert bolts and washers. Um, we have the old school method uh, where they're just using a screwdriver and putting stuff on the work surface. Um, if you implement something like on the right, we have a tool balancer with a driver and also you can use a clamp to hold the item so they don't have to hold the item while they're working on it. Uh, it can take a lot of the strain and repetitive exertions out of that process. And then once again, when they're not using the driver, the tool balancer can lift it up and out of the way, but still within easy reach when they need it. Next example, please. Odor and color coding. Uh, this, we're gonna still stay on the assembly task. Now, um, when you're dealing with assembly items, many times you have many different parts. So as you're going through the process, you may need X washer and then you need a bolt and then you need Y washer and then another bolt and then a nut. Uh, sometimes when you have different, uh, different products or different operations, you may have a multitude of these items on the surface. So a lot of times when you see bins on a surface, they're a lot of the same colors. And when you're starting to put the same, like different items in the same bins, it can be difficult for the operators at times to determine which bolt or which washer or what nut is needed at the different times. So by doing something as simple as color coding the bins and putting them in the correct order, uh, when I say correct order, that's usually as you would read a page from top to bottom, left to right. So as you color code it, it creates a different, uh, a difference in the other parts or other bins so operators get more used to and they can easily identify different parts. Next slide, please. So here's another workstation example. This is showing some of the things we just talked about. You have an overhead tool track with the trolley and the balancers. Uh, you have an example of the articulating bin holders as well as standard bin rails with the color-coded bins on them. Next slide, please. Last and certainly not least, lighting. Um, can't tell you how many times I have walked into scenarios where they are in a warehouse or just a very poorly lit uh, area. And it's amazing the difference that uh, correct lighting can have. Um, in addition to dim lighting, you do have to be cautious because too much light can also be a problem. But normally when you run into these scenarios, there are many different options you can use in order to correct this. I mean, of course you have natural light. If you're lucky enough to have windows and the light comes in through those windows, that can be a fantastic, uh, fantastic thing to have. If that's not available, then you have general overhead lighting, say in a warehouse on the ceilings, if that's not, not available, you, many workstations offer general purpose lighting that can be put right above the surface. And finally, task lighting. That was when you get into more precision and you need more light to focus on smaller or more precise tasks. If I could have the switch, show. Yeah. Here's some more examples of lighting. As we mentioned, the LED overhead lighting, that's a general purpose light that attaches directly to a workstation. And the nice thing about this also is that if you have a height adjustable workstation, that moves along with it. Moving over, we have uh, task lighting. We have ring magnifiers, as well as max magnifiers. Again, these, these are for the more precision tasks or things that you really need to hone in on. And here's another example. Uh, this shows the overhead lighting, as well as the ring magnifiers. It also shows an example of the height adjustable monitor arms and the height adjustable keyboard arms. You'd have to move forward. Well, Rob, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are relating to those challenges that you talked about and want to use those solutions in their workspaces. So are there any tools available that can help us organize or set up our workstations or work areas? Oh, absolutely. There's a number of tools. Um, one of the more valuable tools are configurators. Um, Boston Tech, in our cells, we have our, a very excellent configurator. Um, these are great when you're starting to get ideas together. 
Uh, you can start building workstation or workstations uh, with standardized components and it can be very valuable because it can give you an idea of the space as well as what fits, what doesn't fit and where things should be positioned. Uh, also very valuable because you can take this information once you're done with it, not only uh, print up a copy of the finished station, or, but you can also email it to yourself as well as your team so you can all start to collaborate on these different designs. Another uh, very valuable tool is this task analysis tool. Uh, this is actually a free resource uh, with ergonomic assessment tools uh, to allow you to evaluate a number of different tasks within your processes. Uh, so let's say, for example, you're trying to assess a two-handed lift. Um, this, this will download the NIOSH lifting equation for you uh, to assess that task. It also has uh, tools to evaluate things like one-handed lifting, pushing, pulling, um, or upper extremity tasks. So you just select the task that you're trying to analyze and it will download the tool as an Excel file. Uh, so not only can you use the tool in real time, but you can also save the document for future use. Uh, this, this tool actually does also use published and validated data. Very valuable tool. All right, thank you, Rob. Right now, let's switch back over to Jeff, our numbers and studies guy. Let's talk about some evidence that these result in measurable benefits. Okay, sure. And and actually, that's a, we wanted to answer the question, now that Rob has explained all of these different ergonomic principles that can be implemented within these workstations, okay, can we see a quantifiable difference between those workstations that, that do incorporate those principles and those that do not? So that's exactly the question we wanted to answer. And we looked at these at these measures. So we looked at productivity, motion, ergonomic risk, uh, ease of use, and, and even preference. So these this was a study done uh, within our labs at the Ergonomic Center. That's part of NC State University, um, and we recruited you know uh, ten different subjects for this. Uh, and I'll go through the a little bit more about the methods and, and some of the results that we found. <clears throat> So in terms of the study design, again, what we wanted to, to be able to see is um, whether or not there were truly differences in, in between workstations that, again, instituted these design principles and those that did not institute these ergonomic design principles. So we wanted to look at uh, the impacts on productivity. We wanted to look at the impacts uh, of, of time and motion. We wanted to look at the impacts of ergonomic risk on, on the body. Uh, we wanted to collect usability feedback from these employees. So uh, again, between these two different workstation types, uh, I mentioned we looked at 10 different subjects. So we, it was a, a split design. We have five, five female and, and five male, all different um, heights and weights and, and BMIs. Uh, and we had them perform two different tasks. So we basically had a standardized assembly task that was less than a five minute cycle time where they basically had to install, I think it was 10 different bolts and 10 different washers into a sub-assembly was that assembly task. And then we had them do a, um, a standardized packaging fulfillment task. So this is basically where we had them uh, assemble a, uh, a smaller box, um, put in some bubble wrap into that box, put the sub-assembly into the box, tape it closed and also assemble a larger box and put the smaller box back into the larger box and then on it goes down the uh, down the production line. So that was a, a basic description of the fulfillment or the, the packaging tasks that we um, that we based the study uh, design upon. So if you yep, advance. Uh, so in terms of the productivity, we basically just looked at differences in cycle time, right, um, with the ideal workstation and and one that did not follow these principles. From a, a motion study standpoint, we looked at the number of upper extremity motions and categorized those. We actually had some uh, lean experts that participated in this study, and they looked at the number of value-added motions versus the number of non-value-added motions. So if you guys are familiar with some of those lean concepts, you know that um, 
value added motions are are basically what your customer is willing to pay for, right? Whereas non value added motions are those things that they're not willing to pay for. So the time it takes to to scan and look around for the bolt that they're trying to grab or uh, the different washer that they're trying to locate, obviously those are non value added motions and non value added time that's still part of your overall cycle time. So we we looked at that as a lean analysis. And then in terms of these, the other objective measures we looked at is we wanted to look at ergonomic risk. And we looked at two different things to quantify ergonomic risk. Uh, the first one was uh, we looked at some of the published data out there on acceptable reach uh, envelopes, both horizontal reach as well as vertical reach based on reach frequency. So there's guidelines out there that define what's acceptable and what's not. So we counted the number of reaches that fell outside of that acceptable work envelope. So that was one of the metrics we looked at for risk. And then the other one, uh, some of you guys may be familiar with this tool. Uh, it's called RULA. It stands for Rapid Upper Limb Assessment. So it's a, it's a task-based tool. So when we present the results, you'll see it broken out by task. But it's a, it's a tool that is, is more heavily weighted towards posture but it's really predicting risk amongst the back, um, the elbows and the hands and the wrists, which were more of the vulnerable body parts uh, with this study design. Okay, and next. So some of the, we also wanted to collect some subjective feedback from the participants that made up this study. Uh, so we had them rank order uh, the performance amongst various questions um, in, in rank order, different workstation types, also looking at comfort, um, we wanted to get some feedback on usability. So we used, uh, a, it's actually a, a published and somewhat validated tool called the system usability scale. It's, it's basically 10 different questions and then you score it and it gives you a score uh, all the way up to a hundred. Um, so the higher the, the, the score, the higher the usability of the workstation. And then we also could just collected some, some open feedback or comments from those users. So I know you guys are eager to learn about the results, right? <laughs> so let's get into it. Um, can get it yep, to the next one. So this is looking at the packaging task that was completed, and this is just the cycle time. So what you see on the left is more the traditional design workstation versus the, the one that followed the more uh, the, the ergonomic principles in that design. Uh, and you saw uh, for the packaging task, it went from a 2.7 minute cycle time down to a 2.2 minute cycle time. So what is that? 18.5% uh, um, improvement in, in cycle time. Uh, so not too bad, right? If we move on to the next one and we look at the assembly task, this one went from a cycle time of 4.62 minutes down to 3.78 minutes. So what is that? About the same, right? 18, I think that's 18% improvement if you advance. Yeah, there you go. So again, a pretty good improvement in, in productivity. So if you can get out 18% uh, more product out the door, you know, uh, you can put a, a, a dollar figure to that amount. Okay, next. So if we look at the, the lean analysis, so that so more of the time in the motion study part of it, this is, uh, this is the, that packaging task that I was telling you guys about. So you can see just the difference in the value added versus non-value added time uh, between the, the two different workstation types. So on the left hand side, you're seeing the traditional workstation type and then the, the more ergonomic design uh, principles on the right side. And so you know, we saw the value added time go from, you know, only 22% all the way up to 49%. Uh, and the, again, the non-value added time going from 78% down to 51%. So that's a 27% improvement uh, with the lean, the lean um, you know, improvement. And then if we look at the assembly task, uh, similar results. So, you, you know, we went from a 41% uh, value added time all the way up to 80% value added time with the the workstation that followed these ergonomic principles and non-value added going from 59% down to 20%. So if we advance one, what is that? A 39% improvement. So, uh, you know, moving the needle quite a bit. Okay. And so let's look at some of the other results that we, that we found. 
uh, this is the first metric that we looked at for the risk reduction. So these are the average number of reaches that fell outside of the acceptable work envelopes or reach zones that we defined. So you can see the traditional 20.5 reaches that fell outside of that, of that envelope down to 11.2. Um, so what is that? An improvement of, yeah, uh, almost 50% improvement uh, in reach. Okay, and then uh, we'll get into the, uh, that was for the uh, assembly task, looking at the packaging task. We went from 31 reaches that fell outside of that recommended zone down to just under 13 reaches that fell outside that recommended zone. So what is that? Yeah, almost a 60% improvement. Okay, and then looking at the RULA scores, and if you guys are familiar with RULA, you know that there's, there's basically four different um, tiers or risk levels. There's basically like the negligible risk, um, then there's the low risk, then moderate risk, and then high risk. So it only goes up to seven, right? And, and again, you guys that are familiar with RULA know that you have to look at this by task, right? So looking at the assembly task, there were uh, four different subtasks that made up that assembly task. So we had to break those down separately. So you can see that, that those risk reductions um, ranged anywhere from, you know, the hand tightening. We basically saw that, you know, there was really no difference with the hand tightening because the participants, to get the bolts started, to get the threading started, they would hand tighten it, whether or not they had a manual tool or the power tool. Okay, so that's why we saw it. We didn't see a difference for that. But you look at some of these other tasks, um, like holding the tool versus using the, the clamp for the product, we saw a 30% reduction in risk. Um, the, the one there that you see, to the, the second one there, reaching for the bolts, because we use that swing arm uh, versus using a standardized rail that went along the back of the workstation, uh, we saw a 21% reduction in risk. Uh, and then using the manual tool versus the power drivers, we saw a 24% reduction in risk for that task. So again, that's all of the results based on the assembly uh, task we had these 10 participants complete. So if we move on to the, the next one, uh, here's an overview of the packaging task. So this one obviously had many more subtasks that we had to break out and, and itemize separately. But if you just look across the board, you know, again, some of the tasks, there, were, there was no difference, there was no change because they did it the same way you know, uh, regardless of, of, of the different workstation types. But just looking across the others, you can see it ranged anywhere from, uh, you know, 8% all the way up to 40, 46% reduction. For example, reaching for that large box, um, you know, a pretty large reduction in risk for that particular task. And you can see what it is across the board for those other uh, various subtasks there. <clears throat> And then finally, we looked at the usability and used a, again, a quantifiable tool to test usability. And this, again, gives you this score, um, you know, all the way up to 100. So, you know, we all know that 100 is perfect. Um, so it's just like a, you know, a, a test that you may take at home uh, is how this thing is scored. But uh, you could, it's a series of these 10 questions and that then you, you, um, you score each one of those 10 questions and that gives you a total score. So on the left hand side, you can see with this graphic, it goes from, you know, roughly a 55 score all the way up to a 90, uh, which puts you into that su superior category. So what is that a 64% improvement? So a huge improvement in, in usability. And then the packaging task, what you're seeing there on the, the right hand side goes from a, you know, roughly a 45 up to a roughly an 83 into that acceptable zone. So that's a 76% improvement in usability. Um, so pretty substantial. And I think one more metric I wanted to, to present on. So this was just the preference. So they rank order the preference between the one that followed those ergonomic design principles and the one that did not based on these five different questions. And you can see it was across the board. No one preferred the traditional workstation versus the one that instituted these sound ergonomic design principles. <clears throat> so probably not surprising there, but just wanted to share. And that summed up the, uh, the study.
Thank you, Jeff. Now that we know the productivity that can that can be achieved, uh, we want to start building. So let's go to Rob right now and, and talk about some examples of what an ergonomic workstation may look like. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, workstations, we're just going to go through a couple of uh, examples pretty quickly. I mean, going through, you know, a, a company's product portfolio, I mean, you can certainly use a lot of standardized parts to build a very ergonomic uh, solution. Uh, I wanted to go through a couple that were not quite normal solutions, um, but again, fit very specific needs. Um, just to start with these two right here, I mean, you have a couple of stations that uh, many parts you could find in say like a, our Boston Tech catalog, uh, but we did add some custom uh, parts to it as well. Um, it's for example, ones like the one on the left uh, has underworked surface shelving for corrugate. That's a pretty standardized product. You have corrugate storage up above, but you also have things like a, a hanger bar, which uh, kind of difficult to see, but it runs along the top shelf. Uh, as well as adding additional hanger shelves. Um, the one, the station you see on the right uh, tends to get into a little bit more specialized. Uh, this is an example of a put to light station. Uh, lights were retrofitted to these, uh, this workstation in order to light up cubbies. So as they were trying to fulfill orders, the, uh, the operator would take the, the, the item, scan it, and then a light would say, come up to the, one of the cubbies and then that's where they would start building the order. As the order was built, then and it was completed, then a light would indicate to the operator that the order was done. That way they can take it out of the cubby as well, and then put it into a box and send it on its way. Um, this has a lot of cubbies up above for that operation as well as on the surface, it has larger cubbies for things like boxes of shoes or things that didn't fit into the smaller cubbies. Uh, this particular station also incorporated printers below the surface. Uh, on the right-hand side of the station, you'll notice two uh, pullouts. Uh, the larger one was for an invoice printer. The smaller one to the left of it was more for a, a label or thermal printer, as well as it had storage for additional supplies, boxes, labels, things like that, packing tape. Um, but that's that's these types. Let's see if we can move on. We'll check out a couple more. Uh, the yellow station is, was a very specialized uh, solution. Uh, this one uh, started with a standardized base frame, but then kind of evolved into a very uh, customized piece. Uh, this has a printer pullout on it uh, that can accommodate four, a four tray printer. And above that, we had built a special tray to hold the, uh, the tape dispenser, a water activated tape dispenser. Uh, the individuals who put the station together went so far as to align a hole in the surface right above a garbage can so that as labels printed off the zebra printer on the top shelf, uh, the paper fed right into the barrel so the operators did not have to worry about tearing off paper or waste time uh, tearing paper, crumpling it, throwing it into a garbage can. So. That was an extremely uh, specialized station. The blue one is another example of stations with printer pullouts. Uh, we have a large label printer on the left of that station, followed by another thermal printer, as well as uh, shelf storage for larger items uh, on that station. Move over to the next slide. This is not exactly what you think about when someone says a workstation. Uh, this was another application of a uh, put to light. This utilized large cubby, cubbies um, on a U-shaped frame. The unique thing about this is that not only do the cubbies raise and lower, they're all height adjustable, but if you look into the center, there is a black column that is also height adjustable. Now I'll explain why that was important because when items were coming into the station, they came into the back of the station, which is where that black column was. Uh, items came up on a conveyor, dropped into that cubby in the middle. And as the individual, again, when they came in for their shift, they set that work table to the exact height they wanted. And then they were able to adjust all the cubbies to the, the correct height so they didn't have to reach too far or bend down too low. 
So as the, the items came in through the back, they would pick them up out of the bin and there was a, a scanner above it. As a put to light typically works, they show the item to the scanner, a light would illuminate on one of the bins and then they would put that item into that bin. Again, as the orders got fulfilled, they would be notified and then they could put it together and send it on its way to be shipped out final. Next slide, please. Couple of other examples. Uh, you have a uh, station on the left that is uh, has a conveyor embedded into it. So it actually helps with moving heavy objects across the surface. So in, in addition to, as you can see, the, the tilting surface on it or the tilting conveyor, um, it was also height adjustable. So the individual could adjust the height of the station so they would be able to easily move totes across the station. But as they got the totes in front of them, they were able to tilt it with a pneumatic lift and look and work and take things out of the bins and then do whatever they had to. Then when they were done, they could lower that section and then push it off the station with, without ever lifting anything. The workstation on the right shows another example of uh, ball transfers or transfers built within a work surface. Uh, this has pneumatic transfers in the middle as, in, as well as inset rollers across the back. So as an item came into the station, it would roll in across the back. The pneumatic balls, as you got it to the center, would allow you to lift that item up, pull it towards you, and then drop the balls so it would immobilize that item. So whoever was working on it, they could basically immobilize it work on it so it was safe. And if they even needed to turn it around, they can engage the ball transfers again, turn it around, drop it, and then work on it again. And then when they were done, finally raised up the transfers, pushed it back to the inset rollers, and then pushed it right off to the station again. And as you look on this one, it, you know, it incorporated a couple of other items like lighting and monitors um, and bin rail arms and things like that as well. So next slide, please. And here's just a couple more. Um, I, this one, the going from left to right, you have a height adjustable station with a cutout in it that could be used for scale or other types of equipment. You have stations that have tilting surfaces on them, as well as stations that have bi-level surfaces that not only do you adjust the height of the main surface, but then you can adjust a, one side of it as well to make it more ergonomically correct for whatever operation you're doing. Next slide. And finally, this is just a, another example of a ball transfer surface. This particular one was used for a heavier application. Um, in this particular one, they were sliding on items that were, I believe, close to 100 pounds. And they were able to slide it on with the pneumatic ball transfers. And then they this also tilted. So once again, it's a height adjustable table with a tilt and ball transfers to help, again, position the items so that the operator never had to exert themselves or strain themselves in order to, to work on the items. And I think that's, oh. And workstations come in many shapes or forms. They're not all height adjustable, but they can be configured in all kinds of ways. This is just some examples of some uh, U cells uh, with different types of shelving, drawers in power. Next slide. All right. Thank you so much, Rob. Some really great customizable solutions to increase productivity. And that's what this is all about. We hope you enjoyed Jeff and Rob going through this presentation that you may have seen at Modex 2020. It was one of the top 10 seminars there. Right now, though, we want to open up the questions to you, the viewer. Um, you will see a chat box. So if you have any questions uh, that relate to your workplace that you want to ask these experts, now is the time to do so. But we do have a couple submissions already. Uh, so since Rob just left off, let's go to Jeff for this one. And this person wrote, if my company invests in adjustable, customizable workstations that incorporate these ergonomic principles, how do I cost justify them to my management or show ROI? Jeff? Let's see, I'm not muted. I think I'm, I think I'm still on. You guys can hear me, right? <laughs> yes, you're good. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, well, I, you know, I, I think you can look at a couple of different things. You can, you can look at productivity gains. Um, you know, while, like we saw in our study, you may not always get, 
you know, an 18% gain in productivity, but, you know, even if you went with a more conserva- conservative number, like a, like a 10% product, uh, productivity gain, um, you could show that value by a 10% increase in, in profits per year. Uh, so depending on what your, you know, your profit margin is for the products that you guys make, let's just say, um, I'll just try to make some numbers up off the top of my head. And uh, let's just say your, you know, your profit is $10 a unit um, and each workstation in its current state, uh, let's say it puts out a, a hundred units per day, right? And you have, let's say you have 10 different workstations, workstations at your, at your facility. You, you may have more than that, but Let's just go with 10 for simplicity's sake. I'm trying to keep everything in tens. <laughs> so, you know, if instead you implement a, an improved um, an improved workstation design and, and you can, in, instead of putting out 100, 100 units per day, you can put out 110 units per day, right? That's, that's a 10% productivity gain. Uh, now you're making, what is that, $1,000 extra per day? Right, ten units times ten dollars of profit per unit times ten different workstations. So you know if your if your facility is um, is open, let's say three hundred and fifty days a year, now you're making uh, again a thousand dollars extra per day. So that's three hundred and fifty thousand extra dollars of of extra profit that you're making, and that's just in the productivity gains by itself. That doesn't even incorporate. Um, you know, injury cost avoidance if you're implementing a you know more ergonomically uh, friendly design. So that, that you know that's where you can also look at your workers' compensation data uh, and use that Washington State calculator to also add that into any of these you know productivity gains that you may be uh, predicting. So um, just throwing that out there is you know additional leverage and additional justification that you can consider. You know, if you're paying out $100,000 per year in workers' compensation uh, claims, and you can show that this improvement is going to make even a uh, even a 20% uh, improvement in ergonomic risk, then you're saving you know 20% of $100,000, right? So that's another $20,000 of of gains um, that you're making by implementing these these types of uh, solutions. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> I think so, Jeff. That sounds good to me. The numbers uh, are a big, big deal. So let's go to Rob right now. Um, We have about 10 minutes left in our webinar here. So if you have any questions, now is your time to ask these two experts. Just submit them on our chat box right here. But Rob, there's someone who is almost convinced out there watching. Uh, You showed us some of those custom workstations. And this person said, custom workstations seem to have a lot of advantages when setting up a station in my facility. It sounds expensive and like a drawn out process though. How long would your lead time be on custom stations and how much pri- how much more pricey are they really? Well, I mean, that type of, uh, that can go a couple of different ways. It depends on how intricate it is. Um, I mean, many times uh, a, a company was, I'll just go through the process. Uh, so ultimately, a, a company would come to us, uh, for example, and they would start to tell us about their situation. They would show us what you know they're doing now and what they're ultimately looking to do. Um, as far as the lead times and how long it takes, uh, again, it depends because uh, it depends on you know how many people are involved in the conversation. Um, I mean, as far as design goes, uh, myself, I mean, designing can be as quick as a day or two, or if it's a very involved one, it it can be a week or so. Um, But then again, normally the process we follow is I will uh, work in a consultative manner with the end user. And we'll, we'll, again, we'll sit down, we'll figure out what's happening, what needs to happen, what problems we have that we need to correct. And then I would typically start putting ideas together. I'll build a couple solutions, uh, one or two, and then I would submit them to the team. Now that team would deliberate. I mean, sometimes that could be as quick as a day. Uh, that could be a month. It depends on your team. You know them better than I do. But uh, we would be going back and forth until you know everyone has a say in it and is it agrees that it is a good solution and it works. Um, once we've finalized the designs, then as far as lead time goes, uh, even something as custom as that uh, 
that cubby lift that you saw. Uh, that's the type of thing that lead time on that, once we receive an order, it could be about six weeks before it leaves our, our factory. Um, again, price-wise, uh, I have had a lot of experience and I've seen a lot of different companies and how they do things. And, and I can't say I know how much anyone else uh, uh, charges, but uh, I know that many of the folks that we work with, uh, we are very reasonable when it comes to customization. Um, and something that I'll, I bet Jeff could probably speak to much better, but just the return. I mean, you may be investing a bit of money up in front uh, for a workstation or a customized solution, but in the end, if it is a, a good sound solution, it increases your productivity, productivity and it helps uh, cut down on injury, then that what really was the cost of the station? You know, if even if it was say a three or four thousand dollars, I'm not saying that's what these stations cost, but just even if it was like a three thousand dollar station, if you're saving X amount in, in injury and your productivity goes up 18, 20 percent uh, over a year or two or three, that's going to pay it back in dividends. So. Yep, that's a good payoff. Thank you, Rob. Let's just keep going back and forth with you guys. Uh, so, Jeff, this one is going to you. And this is coming from a viewer who is in a very good position, in, in my opinion, because he's starting from scratch right now. So he needs your help uh, with recommendations. How do I go about planning the workflow and processes to take ergonomics into consideration? What are the most important areas I should pay attention to, in your opinion? Yeah, that's a great question and, and a tough one, uh, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I think as part of that workflow, uh, you need to understand your your touch points. So if you're starting with a, a facility design, um, you know you have to understand first of all, you know where your product is coming in. So where the receiving is, and what touch points are going to occur in receiving. And then once it's received, um, what are the manual touch points that may occur once it comes in to where it's being stocked? You know, is that stocking of your shelves, is that done manually? Is it done through, a, you know, an automated storage and retrieval system? Uh, as well as once it's in stock, if you're going out to workstations, whether it's a fulfillment center or, you know, some type of assembly or manufacturing um, what are the manual, you know, touch points to get it to those workstations? Uh, what physical tasks are, are involved? You know, are, is there one-handed lifting that occurs? Is there two-handed lifting that occurs? Um, and what are those physical tasks that occur at those, at those stations all the way through until once it leaves the facility? So understanding where in your workflow all of those manual, more physically demanding tasks occur is, is I think a great starting point because we saw, again, according to the data that's out there, your overexertion injuries, those material handling injuries are by far the leading category of your most uh, disabling workplace injuries. So that would be my advice. There's, you know, there's lots of ergonomists that are out there. There's industrial engineers that could also help you dissect uh, that question a little bit more and, and provide some design guidance. But, you know, obviously, you know, the physical tasks and again, those material handling tasks are typically where we see, you know, the injuries and the, and the bottlenecks uh, that occur. Hopefully okay. that answers your question. It does. So we have time for one more question. Going from someone tuning in who is starting from scratch to someone who's in the opposite situation, Rob, this person says, I have fixed stations in my warehouse and it will be a while before we can make the change to height adjustable. So in the meantime, what kind of accessories would you recommend for a packaging operation? Well, and again, as I said earlier, um, it's funny, even though you're doing the same operation, everyone seems to do it a little bit differently. Um, so, I mean, I say the first thing we need to do is we need to take a look at what you have right now and see where the pain points are, uh, where we're having issues or, you know, where we could be having some, uh, some uh, opportunity for injury. Um, I mean, things that we could incorporate simply are things like pneumatic monitor arms or pneumatic keyboard arms or uh, 
we could, depending on what the stations look like already, uh, we might be able to look into things like printer shelves or printer pullouts uh, to add in there again, to, to clear off the surface and create more way in space for the task that needs to happen. Um, but uh, again, every operation is different. So again, every it's not just as simple as uh, you know, X, Y, and Z can help you out. But again, things like right out of the gate that if you don't already have, things like the, the monitor arms, keyboard arms, pullouts, uh, printer shelves, and things like that, as well as uh, uh, label troughs, you know, to help position things correctly. Uh, those are things right out of the gate you could look into. All right, thank you so much, Rob Doucette and Jeff Hoyle. Thank you both for walking us through this study and sharing your valuable insights and actionable takeaways with all of us today. So to everyone watching, be sure to download the handout. It's right in the link in the chat window. And if you would like to connect with Rob and or Jeff, their contact information is in that chat window as well. We will leave it up for a couple of minutes so you can gather that information. But thanks again to everyone at Boston Tech and the Ergonomic Center of North Carolina State University for today's discussion. I'm Juliana White with Industrial Sage.